I don't know about you, but last week, I was uh, this close to crying the whole time, so my head hurt. And I, I think I realized, like, man, I'm emotionally invested in all of these people, and it was so powerful in so many ways. But I just was thinking, what's interesting is what we're about to do in the next few minutes and opening up these scriptures, that church is not you intellectually agreeing to a bunch of doctrine. Church is you being adopted into a family that you can belong to. And I think what I'm, I'm sensing, especially with some of the older people in our church right now, me included, and I know I just consider myself old, I know I'm not old, but I have a kid, so that kind of counts. The thing I'm starting to realize is I think a lot of people are discovering the limits to intellectualizing God. And what I mean by that is I think a lot of people are starting to realize that, man, I don't just become more spiritually mature because I can know more Bible verses, because I can know more stuff, because I can know more things. I think a lot of us are on this spiritual hamster wheel of trying to know more and know more and know more and know more. And that's good. Your Bible matters, of course. But what I'm seeing is that there's a lot of people who are realizing that God doesn't want to transform your brain into a Bible encyclopedia. God wants to transform your whole being into a person of love in the image of Jesus. And so what I'm sensing and seeing is that church is kind of transitioning into this family you belong to, that we're inspired by the Word of God, and we can look to the Word of God to shepherd us. And so today we're going to go there, this church in Thessalonica in Acts chapter 17. We're going to get there in a second. Everybody immediately tried to turn there. Get there in a second. But there's this phrase that Paul says back to this church after he plants it, and it's in 1 Thessalonians 2, and he says that we were delighted to not just share with you the gospel of God, but to share our lives as well. Another translation I read of that verse says, we were eager to share our souls with you. So that's the title of this sermon, Eager to Share Our Souls. Eager to Share Our Souls. And what you're going to sense as we start to read this passage of Scripture is that what happens is, is that Paul reveals his heart. And in defense of his ministry, when people come against Paul, he does not look to the truth of his claims. He looks on the basis of his character. And he says, I loved you guys so much so that we were eager to share our souls. And my question today is possibly, if you're riding the emotional roller coaster of faith, I believe that that could be solved by your eagerness, your willingness to share your soul with others. So we're going to go there in the scriptures. If you have your Bible, hold it up. Hold it up. Hold it up in whatever room you're in, in Birmingham, anywhere else. I'm going to do this Bible drill a little bit different. All I'm going to ask you is this. If you already have Christmas lights up, leave your Bible up. You guys are the most joyful of us all. Don't anybody tell you you can't put your Christmas lights up when you want to. Turn with me to Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17. Oh, man. Can't wait. Christmas is almost here, guys. But it's not here yet. So chill. All right? We're going to be in Acts chapter 17, but we got a double portion today. We're going to do a little something different. You're going to also turn to 1 Thessalonians 2. Yeah, it's going to be great. And the reason why we're doing that is because I don't know if you've ever seen like a narrative of something, like you saw the events happen, but then you saw the first person view later. Like think about a, like a documentary. Anybody see Last Chance You? Sorry, wrong one. The Last Dance is what I was thinking of. The Last Dance, not Last Chance You, sorry. The Last Dance, Michael Jordan. It's like one thing to watch him win six championships. It's another thing for him to say, it was personal. You know what I mean? So Paul does that. So we're going to go to that in just a second. But we're going to start in Acts chapter 17 first, and we're going to read all the way to verse 9. And this is Paul in Thessalonica. If you're there, say I'm there. Had to do it. When Paul and his companions had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, They came to Thessalonica, where there was a Jewish synagogue. As was his custom, Paul went into the synagogue, and on three Sabbath days, he reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and proving that the Messiah had to suffer and rise from the dead. This Jesus I am proclaiming to you is the Messiah, he said. Some of the Jews were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a large number of God-fearing Greeks and quite a few prominent women. But other Jews were jealous. So they rounded up some bad characters from the marketplace, formed a mob, and started a riot in the city. They rushed to Jason's house in search of Paul and Silas in order to bring them out to the crowd. But when they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some other believers before the city officials, shouting, These men 
who have caused trouble all over the world have now come here. And Jason has welcomed them into his house. They are all defying Caesar's decrees, saying that there is another king, one called Jesus. When they heard this, the crowd and the city officials were thrown into turmoil. Then they made Jason and the others post bond and let them go. Okay, what did you just read? You just read how Paul and Silas land in Thessalonica. It's a city of about 200,000 people on the sea. And they just, it's actually the capital of Macedonia, which if you remember the vision, it was a man from Macedonia saying, come here, help us. Well, now they're arriving in the capital city of Macedonia in Thessalonica. And as they're doing ministry there, they go to the synagogues. It's probably why they skipped the first two cities. And when they arrive there, they begin to reason, to dialogue, to explain, to open up the scriptures. And some of them were persuaded. But not everyone was. Some of the Jews get jealous, and then they kick them out of the synagogue, and then they go to Jason's house, which is probably where the church started. They go to Jason's house with a bunch of city officials, and they're saying, we have to get rid of these men. They have turned the world upside down. But then Paul and Silas had secretly snuck out the back door on their way to Berea, and now Jason has to pay a security amount of money to ensure that they will never come back to Thessalonica, which is why Paul then writes them a letter. So flip over to 1 Thessalonians. This is um, chapter 2, starting in verse 1. And this is what Paul says, his first person account of the ministry that you just read. He says this, You know, brothers and sisters, that our visit to you was not without results. We had previously suffered and been treated outrageously in Philippi, as you know, But with the help of our God, we dared to tell you his gospel in the face of strong opposition. For the appeal we make does not spring from error or impure motives, nor are we trying to trick you. On the contrary, we speak as those approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. We are not trying to please people, but God who tests our hearts. You know we never use flattery, nor do we put on a mask to cover up greed. God is our witness. We were not looking for praise from people, not from you or anyone else. Even though, as apostles of Christ, we could have asserted our authority. Instead, we were like young children among you. Just as a nursing mother cares for her children, so we cared for you. Because we loved you so much, we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well. This is powerful, but this is a perspective that I want you to pay attention to, that Paul, in defense of what the Jews accused him of, argued on the basis of his character and the life that he lived, not even on the truth of his claims or the doctrine. This is the king of doctrine himself, Paul. And he's arguing on, you know us, you know the lives that we we led together. So let's go back to the story, Acts chapter 17, we're going to start there. Go back to Acts chapter 17, and we're going to go back and forth, so you don't have to go every single time with the Bible, but it's going to be on the screen. When Paul and his companions had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica where there was a Jewish synagogue. As was his custom, Paul went into the synagogue and on three Sabbath days he reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and proving that the Messiah had to suffer and rise from the dead. Now here's what's so important. This is what's known as logos, the truth. Paul is going to take the same gospel pattern to all the other cities that he goes to. He's going to go to the synagogue and he's going to reason with them, which again, the the Greek word dialogue, dialogamai. It means he's going to reason and understand what they believe so that he can explain and prove that Jesus is the Messiah and it ends with this proclamation of truth. So why does he start with dialogue? He starts with dialogue because the Jewish mindset had a certain preconception about who God was. And it was this, there is no way that our Messiah would ever suffer and die. So he has the dialogue to understand what they mean. And all of us in our lives, we have people in our lives who have certain preconceptions about who God is. The only way to understand what they believe is to ask them, to dialogue with them. And what I've seen is after you start the dialogue, where you go? You go to the scriptures. After he starts the dialogue, he understands what are the lies that they are believing. You have to let the word of God expose those lies. So we go straight from, okay, dialoguing to now opening up and explaining and reasoning with them. Here's why that matters. It's because the depth of your argument is only as deep as the truth of your argument. And here's what's true about this book. Deep calls the deep. It means this book, there's deep in here that calls to the deep in you. Which means that you need to make 
The Bible, the point, not your opinion. That's all I'm saying. Bring them to the scriptures. Let the Bible speak for itself. Let the word of God speak for itself. But he doesn't just do that. He also reasons with them and he explains. And he says it in in 1 Thessalonians 2. He says, and we also thank God continually because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as a human word, but as it actually is, the word of God, which is indeed at work in those who believe. Which I love this so much because the word of God has the power to seize your conscience and captivate your heart. In fact, a theologian I read this week was talking about how the Christians who have turned the world upside down were the ones who had a vision of Jesus in their heart and a Bible in their hands. And so what's interesting is if this claim is true, if Paul is true in his argument, what is the only tactic of the enemy? To destroy his character. To destroy, to undermine the validity of the message, you have to take down the messenger. Just look at everything related to Christian news right now and every pastor that's fallen. Why does he do that? Let me, let me just use an illustration real quick. Um, has anybody gotten an argument recently? It was like, oh wait, is my wife holding it up or not? I don't know. It's like <laughs> married people Bible drill, right? Um, here's the deal. If you got an argument re- recently, here's what I know to be true. At least this is true of me, okay? What happens when the logic of your argument starts to break down? I go for the character blows. I go for the long list of things in the past that you have done. Oh, the way you did the dishwasher that one time. Oh, the way, all of a sudden you start bringing out things from the past and you start trying to just destroy their character because you have nothing left. It's more about, not about the logic of the argument, it's more about the emotion of the moment. You know what I'm talking about? Where you're like in an argument like that? So here's what happens, is that when people start losing the logic of the argument, they have to go for emotion. This is a tactic from Satan himself. What he wants to do is he wants to destroy the messenger. He wants to destroy the character of who is speaking, which is Paul in this situation. So he has to clarify. For the appeal we make does not spring from error or impure motives. Nor are we trying to trick you. But on the contrary, we speak as those approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. We are not trying to please people, but God, who tests our hearts. Okay, we have to adopt this posture as believers. What does he, what does he say here? He says, look, I came to you guys, and I was approved by God, which means I knew my identity. I was entrusted with the gospel, which means that it's not mine anyways. It's just a gift to give away. And lastly, I didn't even come to please you guys. I came to please God himself, the one who tests his heart, who tests our heart. And he says this, and I believe that's the basis behind why his message landed so well. So if you think about it, go back up to verse 3. There's two words in here that this week have absolutely wrecked my understanding of this passage because I was wrestling with this idea of why did some respond in faith and some respond in anger? Like what would cause somebody to intellectually hear all of the same facts that some people, their life is completely different, some people, their life completely changes, or someone else completely rejects it? And it's found in these two words, explaining and proving that the Messiah had to suffer and rise from the dead. Now, if you have not been paying attention, just look at me for a second. These two words are so important because Luke, a chapter earlier, uses the same word to describe the Lord breaking open Lydia's heart. The same word, which means Paul's truth that he was giving them wasn't just truth to open up and try to understand. It was truth he was delivering to try to break down the door to their heart. He was explaining and proving. And the best way I can describe it, I'm going to put this quote on the screen, is this. It's all about spiritual blindness. Spiritual blindness is not your inability to see the truth in front of you. Spiritual blindness is your inability to value what that truth means for you. Think about this deeply. Spiritual truth, you're all hearing the same facts. You're all hearing the same truth. You're all hearing that Jesus suffered and rose from the dead. Yet some of you aren't valuing that. That's what spiritual blindness is. So think about this. How does that happen? How does it happen where some can respond to the gospel and truth and some completely miss it and are spiritually blind? It's because we have emotions, we have circumstances, we have sin in our heart that clouds our soul similar to like a spot in your eye or a cataract over your eye. Think about it. It's blocking the ability for the light to even get into your soul. It's why Jesus taught the way he did, by the way. It's why he said, some of you will see, but not see. Some of you will hear, but you won't understand. 
Some of you in this room, even as I speak right now, the truth of the gospel hasn't got to the depth of your soul because no matter how many times you try to wash yourself clean, you still feel dirty. Why? It's because without the Holy Spirit of God opening up your heart, breaking open your heart to the truth about who Jesus is, you won't care. So, what I'm telling you is that as you open the scriptures, your prayer should never be, God, let me just understand and store up knowledge, which Paul says knowledge puffs up anyways, but love builds up. Your prayer should be this, Lord, help me care. Help this matter to me. Help me see that if Jesus is the Messiah, if he really did suffer and if he really did rise from the grave, that changes everything for me. But this sin in me and this pain in me and these emotions are blocking me from seeing what's true right in front of my face. And I'm spiritually blind. So God, help me see. Holy Spirit, help me care. And Paul was dialoguing and reasoning and breaking open the scriptures because it changed everything. And that's why he said, this Jesus I am proclaiming to you is the Messiah. Some of the Jews were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a large number of God-fearing Greeks and quite a few prominent women. Notice how Paul does not stop with dialoguing. He doesn't stop with opening the scriptures. He stops with proclaiming and preaching. So Christian in the room right now, if you've been listening to me this whole time, hopefully your heart has been bursting forth because your life has been seized by this great affection. Hopefully your conscience can be clean. Hopefully your foundation is on the cornerstone of Jesus Christ. But Christian in the room, hear me say, your life is not supposed to stop at dialogue. Your life is not supposed to stop at just opening this up in a Bible study. Your life is supposed to preach and proclaim. And the, life, the lie that I hear in the college ministry that I get to serve in all the time is, I'm just going to preach the gospel with my life and when necessary, use some words. Well, according to the Bible, words are always necessary. And I'm not saying that lifestyle doesn't matter. No, no, no. Here's what your lifestyle is. Your lifestyle prov provides the foundation for your words to actually have value. Your lifestyle is what lays the foundation. People go, you really believe this stuff, don't you? You really believe that there's a God who hears you? You really believe that all of this changes everything about you? Yes! And as a mentor once told me, he said, you should live in such a way that it forces people to take your God seriously. And then you should tell them about that God. And a lot of us in this room are too scared to take that next step. And Paul even makes the argument himself. Verse five, he says, you know, we never use flattery, nor do we put on a mask to cover up greed. God is our witness. Some of you, if you hear nothing else from this sermon, you need to circle that word flattery in your, in your Bible. Flattery is not a word that like, hey, I say nice things. Flattery from a biblical perspective means that you tailor the truth to fit popular opinion. So biblical flattery is, I'm going to tailor the truth to fit the popular opinion. In other words, it's why you and your relationships, why you stoop lower to the person in your friend group who's less spiritually mature. It's all in this intentional effort to try to one day reach them. So you start living a certain way that's maybe not fully in line with the scriptures. And then you're, what you tell yourself is, well, I'm, I'm doing this to try to reach them one day. But actually what you're doing is your lifestyle is diluting the message you're trying to preach. Biblical flattery, for us, we have to understand, it's not about tailoring the truth. God is our witness, is what Paul says. God is our witness. I just think, someone obligated to speak for the one who tests the heart would be completely foolish to change the message for the hearers. And Paul doesn't do that. He says, God is my witness. So my first point, really it's more of a question. We're going to kind of ask questions as we go through the rest of this time together. My first question is this. Is your distance from God established by fact or influenced by feeling? Is your distance from God established by fact or influenced by feeling? And here's why I'm asking it the way I'm asking it is because I just have found in my life that my distance from God a lot of times is not established in reality. My feelings are creating a false reality that I'm starting to believe. And so here's what I mean by fact or feeling. I mean that some of you in this room right now, I could go through every logical evidence to prove to you that Jesus was here. He was a real man. His body has still not been found. I can prove to you the historical accuracy of every single thing about this Bible, how it is so pure, it's inerrant, 
It's infallible. I could prove to you, even through my own life, miracle after miracle, story after story, experience after experience, about the fact that Jesus is real. He is who he says he is. And I can give you all the logical evidence in the world, but you know what's true? Some of you would be blind to it because you have a damaged heart, not because you need more facts. And I just want you to admit it. Maybe my feelings are impacting and directing my reality more than truth itself. Maybe what's in me is preventing me from experiencing all that God has for me. So you have to confess it. You have to open up the conversation and be real and honest about where you're at. That's why Jeremiah says, the heart is deceitful above all things. Desperately sick. Who can understand it? And so I think for me in my life, again, I've just, I've wondered some action steps. Like, what do you, where do you take this? And I think for a lot of us in this room, you need to know that if you're a skeptic about who Jesus is and you do want some more facts, the reality is at some point in your life, you'll never get every answer to all of your questions. Ultimately, becoming a Christian is repenting of ever needing to have all the answers or needing to be in control. Ultimately, becoming a Christian is this relinquishing of control of your life, this utter surrender of your will. And if you're a Christian in this room and you're wrestling with what does it mean for me to ride the roller coaster of emotion in my faith, Am I supposed to like white knuckle my obedience? No, here's what I'm saying. I'm saying that the answer might be found when you finally address the wound. I'm saying that maybe the block that you have with God, the thing that's between you and God, is way less about whether or not all of this is true and way more about the fact that you were hurt when you were a kid. I'm saying for a lot of you in this room, maybe maybe the reason why God feels so distant from you It's because you can't get out the words, I'm sorry. It's not because you don't know all that this book has to offer and all the facts about this and you know all the Bible verses, you know all this stuff. It's because at the end of the day, you won't forgive them. It's because at the end of the day, your heart is hurting. It's because at the end of the day, you're mad at God. And so you need to bring that to God and bring that to God's people because what you will find is there's another kind of king waiting for you. And the other kind of king waiting for you is the kind who would sweat blood, empathizing with the sin that he would pay for the next day for you. That on the cross, you can find life in the new kind of kingdom. And Paul goes into further explanation of what that means. But some Jews are upset. Verse 5. But other Jews were jealous. So they rounded up some bad characters from the marketplace, formed a mob, and started a riot in the city. So what's interesting to me is that the word for jealousy and the word for zealous is the same Greek word, zealos. So you walked in this building, if you're in this building right now, and you walked under, it says, zeal for this house consumes me. Zeal for your house consumes me. The same word for zeal is the same word for for jealousy. So if you think about it, what does it mean to have zeal for God? It means that I I want to burn for the glory of God. I want to matter for God. And jealousy is, man, I want people to burn. And so what happens is with jealousy, there's this thing that happens where they get so jealous. Why? It's because, one, I think their teachings were contradicted. Two, I think they were losing their crowd, which no one cared about Jesus until he started gaining a crowd. And lastly, ultimately, I think they got jealous because they felt that their kingdom was threatened. I think, in my life personally, I've discovered this. I think that jealousy in me reveals where I'm trying to build my own kingdom. I think the jealousy that comes up out of me, my gut reaction, is actually where I'm trying to build my own kingdom. So if you think about this, what is it? It's I want position that you have, or I want to own, I want to possess what is now yours. But if you think about the Christian life, what is the Christian life? The Christian life is utterly positionless and possessionless, which means when you become a Christian, You don't have a position anymore. You are a servant of the Most High God. You are a suffering servant of who Jesus Christ is. He must increase, I must decrease. And at the same time, now everything in my life is his. I've been entrusted with the gospel. I've been entrusted with my stuff. I don't even own anything. So now I'm positionless and I'm possessionless. And every single time I look at the history of Christianity, government after government, ruler after ruler, politician after politician cannot stamp out Christianity. Why? It's because you cannot take someone from a throne that they are not on and you can't take something from somebody who has nothing. All I need is my position in Christ. I'm a son, I'm chosen, I'm holy, I'm dearly loved. And all I have is Christ. 
All I have is Jesus. In Christ alone, my hope is found. We live in a world where you are told to have this righteous zeal protecting your own stuff. And God is telling us to give it all away. So my next question out of this passage is this. Is your zeal to be right, sacrificing relationships that are real? Is your zeal to be right, sacrificing relationships that are real? You know, one of the hardest parts about this passage to me is that I think that the Jews felt that this jealousy they were experiencing, that emotion, was actually a righteous zeal for the law. In other words, I don't think they were aware that what they were doing was at all wrong. And I've seen it in my own life. That what happens to me is when I get so focused on the mission or so focused on the message or building a kingdom, I start all of a sudden sacrificing real people. And I get so stuck on my stuff, my possessions, my things, and I start cramming my vision of rightness down everyone else's throat. And I end up sacrificing a lot of people on the way. But here's the thing about the story that stood out to me. It says they rushed into Jason's house in search of Paul and Silas in order to bring them out to the crowd. But when they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some other believers before the city officials shouting. It's not there. If you ever find yourself dragging people, dragging reputations through the mud about people, or shouting at people for what you believe, even if it's behind a screen, I have just yet to see any person of love, namely Jesus, ever get the last word. And if you notice here, even if they had the righteous intention of the zeal, of the passion for their mission, of the righteousness to protect the law, ultimately, Their decisions don't lie. And their decisions are to drag people and to shout at them. And so many of us do the exact same thing because what happens is pride mixes in with jealousy. And when pride combines with jealousy, you and I, seriously, we cram our vision of rightness down everyone else's throat and then somehow we do it in Jesus' name. So are you so attached? Are you so zealous for the mission and the message? On Sunday, I was so blown away by the fact that these are real people. This isn't just some church mission or some message we're trying to get everybody to agree to. God is changing people's lives, and this is real. So everything is about real people. Continues, verse 6. These men who have caused trouble all over the world have now come here, and Jason has welcomed them into his house. They are all defying Caesar's decrees. I love this phrase. Saying that there is another king, one called Jesus. And when they heard this, the crowd and the city officials were thrown into turmoil. Then they made Jason and the others post bond and let them go. You know it's bad when the Jews are partnering with the Romans to get rid of somebody. You can tell a lot about what you think about your kingdom with who you partner with. They're partnering with the Romans to make their point. And I think we should notice Jason. Jason is a person of influence. He's probably a person that had a lot of money. He's probably somebody who was important. His name means healer. Maybe he was a doctor. And this Jason used and wielded his power and influence, which revealed what he really thought about the kingdom of God. So if you're in this room and you have power, you have influence, you have a lot of money, you have a lot of stuff, you have a lot of things to steward, just know that how you wield that power and who you use your influence for reveals what you really think about the king of God, kingdom of God. And so we see Jason here. But also, I think we have to look back at Paul. Because Paul, everything I've read about 1 Thessalonians 2, everything in his defense was not dragging the Jews through the mud. It was not even defending his doctrinal authority. He was explaining that his love was real. Ultimately, he was explaining that he was eager to share his soul with this group of people. And that's what we're called to do as a church. He says it this way. We were not looking for praise from people. Not from you or anyone else. Even though, as apostles of Christ, we could have asserted our authority. Instead, we were like young children among you. Okay, I need to make this this make sense. So Paul, 
When he says this phrase, what he's really saying is, we could have asserted our authority, meaning I could have asserted my authority. I am the leader. I am the boss. I am the one who is leading the whole church. Yet, when I came to you, I revealed to you that there is another king. But not only is there another king, there is the essence of a new kingdom. And so, this is the kind of king that you are serving now. You know the king, Jesus, who the Messiah is? You know who he is? He's the kind of king who conquers with ambassadors, not armies. He's the one who uses the weapons of grace and truth. He's the one. He's the king who went to the cross so that he could get his crown. He's the one who wants to redeem you and redeem me so that what? So he can reign with us. He's the one that had to die before he could rise so that you and I could rise with him. That's the kind of king you serve. There is another king. There's another king. But then after that, he explains what the kingdom will be like. And he says, we could have asserted our authority over you, but instead, we were like young children. What is he talking about? I think he's reaching back and claiming what Jesus said to his disciples when they were arguing about who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. If you remember that story, what happens? Jesus walks up to his disciples who are arguing about who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven when they get there, and he calls over a little boy or a little child he brings them into the middle of the disciples, and they're all around him. And he said, here's what the kingdom is like. If you guys can't become like this little child, you're not even getting into the kingdom of heaven. And he says, the greatest among us will be like lowly, like this child right here. And this is the essence of the kingdom. He says it this way. He says, and whoever welcomes this little child welcomes me. That's the kind of kingdom. That's the essence of the new kingdom that I'm trying to build. And Paul says, we came to you not to assert our authority or our dominance. We were with you like little children. And then he says this. At the end of that verse, just as a nursing mother cares for her children, so we cared for you. Because we loved you so much, we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well. So for the last point, I really just want to ask this question, and it's kind of a weird question to kind of end with, but it's this. Is your desired legacy fueled by purpose or filled with people? Let me explain. This is a very complicated question because you could be like, oh, my purpose is people. Let me just explain what I mean. I'm trying to get to the deeper level of what's going on in your heart, and here's what's happening. In our culture, we have an individualistic society where all of us are so obsessed with our calling. We're all so obsessed with our unique individuality. We're all so obsessed with our purpose and our calling. So much so that we can start using people to make our purpose go forward. And what I mean by that is, let me just put it this way. Practically, I think a lot of you are living for your purpose, but theoretically, it's for people. But it's still about you. All I'm saying is, what if we flip that? What if our purpose is actually found in the theoretical because we're living for people practically? And so I'm I'm sensing what's happening in this room and I'm sensing what's happening in Paul and I'm sensing what's happening in our church is there's something more. It's that we're eager to share our souls. We're not just here to share a message. We're not just here to share some doctrine or some truth. No, we want you to know that we were eager to share our souls with you. But our culture is telling us so many things. No, it's about you. It's about what you can accomplish and your significance and your success and your name and your brand. In fact, I was talking to Andy the first time we went on a walk, and I was like, what's the first thing that you noticed coming from South Africa that you, about America? He said, I've noticed how every single building is named after somebody. And I was like, what do you mean? He was like, for some reason in America, everyone is so scared to die and so scared to be forgotten of that they just give enough money so they can have a building named after them. And I'm not hating on the people that give a lot of money for a building to be named for different reasons, of good, good purposes. I'm just saying that there's something that it pointed out to me in my heart. That I think that, that I want my name to be great. I want my legacy to be a legend of all the things that I did and the purpose that I fulfilled. And all I'm saying is maybe the point of your life is not to, for one day people look back and say, man, that guy was a legend, or man, that girl was a legend. What if your legacy is the people and that your life was all for one name? that at the end of the day, they forget about you. But then there's this legacy of people who've been a part of your life. And I think that's what Paul was getting at because he closes by saying it this way, for what is our hope, our joy, or the crown in which we will glory in the presence of our Lord Jesus when he comes? Is it not you? Indeed, you are our glory and joy. Pay attention to this because this matters so much. 
is what Paul is saying to this church in Thessalonica. He is saying that when Jesus comes back, when Jesus returns, me, Paul, the apostle, I am not going to talk about all the miracles that I did. I'm not gonna talk about all the mission that we accomplished. I'm not even gonna talk about all the different churches that we planted. I am going to show Jesus, you guys, I'm gonna show them these relationships that we have. I'm gonna show them this church that was bought by the blood of Christ. And here's what I love. I love that the call of every believer is to care in such a way that Paul uses the intimate language of a nursing mother. Notice how it says that? That's such a weird phrase. And if you read it the first time, it was probably confusing. Just as a nursing mother cares for her children, so we cared for you because we loved you so much. We were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well. We were eager to share our souls. So who are you sharing your soul with? Who are you sharing your life with? Who is this for you? And so this week, uh, just to kind of close before we worship, before we sing, this week was like a full circle week for me in so many different ways because the leader of the ministry that we serve in Ecuador was here in town. And if you've never... Uh, I've never told my story. I thought I'd get away with not having to talk about the accident, but here I am, maybe next time. Talking about the accident, I was in an accident where I should have possibly died and it was, it was a horrible situation. And he was here this week and I was having so many emotions brought up about just the, the fear of dying and how much I'm so grateful to be here and how much I really don't care anymore about things that I thought I used to care about. And as he was sitting there, I was thinking about baptism as well and how all week we got to see those stories and I was so excited, eager to share my soul with all of you guys, even in preaching in God's word. And the hoopla of baptism was amazing. I got this privilege to baptize this man named Quinn. Some of you heard the story. And I was thinking back and I was like, you know what? I'll never forget the night that I met Quinn. And it was actually the first time that I came back to work after the accident. We were never forget it. We're standing there, this group of people, and he walks up, and without even thinking for a second, he just starts pouring out what's in his soul, and there was no bow on anything that he said. He was unveiling the extent of brokenness of sin, the extent of abuse, the extent of alcoholism, the extent of the lies of the enemy, and he's unveiling and eagerly sharing his soul to a group of people who can do nothing but give him a hug afterwards and say, Jesus is with you, even if you don't see it. And that began a journey where this past Sunday, watching his face come out of the water was joy like I've never seen. It was pure, unadulterated worship of who Jesus is. His heart was on display. And at the end of the hoopla of this pure moment of worship, of emotion, everybody leaves. We're walking in the lobby. It's quiet. It's dark. Nobody's around. And there's this mom that comes up to me who'd been praying for me the whole time. I've been praying for Quinn the whole time. She comes up to me and she goes, what if God saved your life in Ecuador so you could get the joy of Quinn's story? What if God saved you so you could experience this joy? A real person encountering a real God. And so for you in the room, some of you right now, it's like your soul is bursting forth and you're so much pain and there's so much heartache and there's emotion that's spiritually blinding you from the truth that's right in front of you, there is a God who sees you. There is a God who knows you. There is a God who's calling you to pour out your soul to somebody who's going to wrap your arms around you. Because Jesus and God, could he could have written the message in the clouds, he could have written it and boomed it from the skies, but he decided to not just send a message, he decided to send his son messenger to show the depth of his love for you. So some of you, let's return to the heart of worship. There are believers right now. You can take out your communion sets. We're going to remember the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. We're going to enjoy the presence of God together. And we're going to ask him to restore our hearts of worship to the greatest God we're serving.
So if you didn't get one, you can raise your hands, all of our locations. If you didn't get a communion set on your way in, I have our team running around to grab them, bring them to you. This is a moment I like to encourage all their husbands. This is the time where you pray over your wives, you pray over your family, you enjoy this time with God. You are the leader, so lead. And this is the time I would say that if you're not a believer, you can just put your communion set underneath your seat, but I wanna challenge you to do real business with God. And maybe you tell somebody what's going on and tell somebody your doubts. So take this time with the Lord and then we're gonna come back and worship.